idealized models. Um, so our first speaker of the session will be uh, Mark Zandri. Uh, he will be talking about augmented random oracles. All right. So. All right. So today I'll be talking about a new idealized model, which refines the random oracle model um, in a way that tries to avoid an uninstantiability results. Uh, so imagine we have a crypto system that makes use of a hash function H. Unfortunately, no matter how hard we try, we don't know how to prove security of the crypto system under any typical assumption about H, such as collision resistance. Maybe there is even some sort of impossibility demonstrating that such a proof is impossible. So what do we do? Uh, sorry. Um, so one proposal by Bilari and Ragaway is the famous random oracle model. Um, here, they observe that most crypto systems only make black box use of the hash function. And also, you know, most of the practical attacks we have on crypto systems make black box use of the hash function. So why not abstract that out and um, just force the adversary to only uh, make black box use of the hash function? And the way they formalize this is through a, the random oracle model. So instead of a hash function, you have a truly random function on some domain and range. And now the crypto system and the adversary both just make queries to the hash function uh, in, instead of evaluating it for themselves. Right. Um, so the idea is that one proves security in this model, this idealized model for the hash function. And then we just hope that when we actually instantiate the hash function with a when we instantiate the random oracle with a concrete hash function such as SHA2, the hope is that uh, security remains. Um, unfortunately, Kennedy, Goldreich, and Halevi uh, show what is now known as an uninstantiability result. So what they show is a scheme such that if you have the hash function actually be a random oracle, the scheme is secure. So it's secure in the random oracle model. Um, however, no matter how you try to instantiate the hash function, if you instantiate with any concrete code, suddenly the scheme is insecure. Uh, and so this shows that in general, there's no hope of instantiating the random oracle with any concrete hash function. The, ra the random oracle model heuristic must sometimes fail. Um, and since their work, there have been a number of additional uninstantiability results proven throughout the, the literature um, showing a variety of protocols uh, that are insecure once you instantiate them. Um, nevertheless, despite these works, the random oracle model remains widely used in practice. And in many cases, it is the only way we know how to justify the security of practical crypto systems. Uh, so this brings us to the goal of our work which is to define a new model that somehow avoids these uninstantiability results while still being useful, still being able to uh, prove the security of crypto systems beyond what we can do in the standard model. So to motivate our solution, uh, let's use the encrypt with hash transform as a case study. So the, this transform was introduced by Bilare, Boldreva, and O'Neill. And it's a way to take a probabilistic encryption scheme and make it deterministic. So what the protocol is very simple. So you have some general public key encryption scheme. And now when you want to encrypt a message M, you simply hash the message M to get to your randomness. And okay, you, you also hash, uh, you hash M concat public key to give you domain separation. Um, so you derive your randomness deterministically through some hash function and then encrypt using those random coins, right? So I won't define security here uh, because it's deterministic. We can't get the usual semantic security notion, um, but there is, a, there is a nice security definition. Um, and what uh, this, this work shows is that if the, random, if the hash function is actually modeled as a random oracle, then encrypt with hash is secure according to this definition. Okay, um, but unfortunately, it turns out that in general, encrypt with hash um, is uninstantiable uh, in the following sense. So there is, under a suitable assumption, there is a CPA secure public key encryption scheme such that no matter what hash function you use to instantiate the encrypt with hash transform, 
the result is an insecure protocol. So we, we, we know it's secure in the random oracle model by what BBO proved. But now when we instantiate it with any concrete hash function, it becomes insecure. Okay, so let's just take a moment to see how this uh, impossibility or unessentiability works. So the, we're going to start with some uh, public key encryption scheme. It may or may not be instantiable with, with a hash function, or it may, may or may not give you a secure transform if you apply, to apply encrypt with hash to this public key encryption scheme. But what we're going to do is modify it um, to get a new public key encryption scheme that will be insecure when you try to instantiate the encrypt with hash transform. Uh, so what, what happens? So to encrypt the message M, you encrypt under this starting public key encryption scheme, um, ENC prime, and then you additionally supply this program P sub MR. And this P sub MR is what you're going to use to actually break the security of the transform. So what does this program do? It takes as input code for some function and it uh, will evaluate the function on the, so it'll have the message and randomness hard coded. It will evaluate the function on the message and see if it equals the random coins. If it does, then this function will just output M and otherwise it will reject and output this uh, you know, special bot symbol. All right. So it, the insecurity of the encrypt with hash transform here is, is trivial, right? You just feed the code of whatever hash function you're using to instantiate the transform into the program that's contained in the ciphertext. And just by the functionality of the program, it will output your original message completely breaking security. Um, okay, but we, we actually need a secure public key encryption scheme in order to get an instantiability result because if we, ha if we starting from an insecure public key encryption scheme is meaningless. Um, and the problem is that this modification to our original public encryption scheme actually completely breaks security because this program has um, just hard coded in it. Uh, so what actually happens is you obfuscate it using um, you know some sort of obfuscation scheme, and um, and once you obfuscate it, uh, it at least intuitively, if you are hiding all the de implementation details of the program and are only sort of able to query the program on various inputs, the, the attacker will never be able to actually query the program on any um, message that causes, or any code that causes the function to do anything other than return bots. So this is just an intuition. Um, the, the authors, you know, actually formally prove this under indistinguishability obfuscation, which is the kind of the accepted notion of obfuscation that we use these days. Um, okay, so so the 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 takeaway from this uh, is that VOM and uninstantiabilities, what they use is they use that the concrete hash function that you're trying to instantiate with has code, um, and random oracles do not, right? So we need that the hash function has code in order to create this program P sub M R that we then obfuscate in order to get our our counterexample. Whereas random oracles have no code, there's no way to have a program that uh, sort of implements the code for a random oracle because there is no code. Um, however, the, the key point is that the uninstantiability doesn't actually so much care about what the code is. All it cares about is that it exists so that you can say create a program that has the code in it and then feed it into a obfuscator. Um, so what our goal is going to be is to try to capture this kind of um, uninstantiability. And so what we're going to do is we're going to design a model where a random oracle actually does have code, namely the instruction to make a query. Now, the problem is that, you know, for example, our, our indistinguishability obfuscators, they, we, they don't work for, for functions that make queries. They only work for, you know, functions that are, that are concrete code. But what we're going to do is we're going to design a model that basically gives us obfuscation for Oracle-aided programs. And then this will allow us to actually carry out the unessentiability in our model. OK, so our inspiration is going to be this Ashraf Segev model for obfuscation. Um, they, they came up with this model for entirely different reasons, but it'll be a useful starting point. Um, so what they do is they, they start out with a random Oracle. And then they augment it with another oracle that implements an obfuscation scheme. Uh, so there's going to be a couple parts to this oracle. So one is going to be 
um, a random permutation sigma. And think of this permutation sigma as the, the procedure to obfuscate code. So it's going to take as input the description of some program P, as well as some random coin, so it can be a probabilistic obfuscator. And we'll interpret the output. The output's just a string, but we'll interpret it as some obfuscated code P prime. Um, and then we need to allow you to actually evaluate the obfuscated program. So we'll have another eval oracle. And what it does is it'll take as input this bit string P prime representing some obfuscated program, an input X, and we'll actually evaluate the program for us. So it'll, it'll undo the permutation to recover the original program code P, and then it'll just evaluate P on X. And the crucial point here is that at, at this point, we can actually make eval or the whole obfuscation, we can actually have it work on Oracle aided programs, on programs that make Oracle queries. Um, so the only issue is that we need eval to be able to make queries to the random Oracle. And so that's, that's exactly um, what they do. So if, we, if the input code is a Oracle aided program that makes queries, now the eval function after it recovers the original program code will actually you know, make those queries to the Oracle when it evaluates. All right, now the reason that um, Ashrav and Segev introduced this model was they were trying to study the limits of obfuscation and prove that you know, obfuscation can't be used for certain applications. Um, and, but, but nevertheless, as I said, we're gonna use this model as our, as our starting point. So our, our initial idea is to prove security in this AS model instead of the ROM. So if you, if you had some crypto system let's say you could prove it secure in the random oracle model, but you're kind of concerned that there's a uninstantiability, there might be an uninstantiability result for it. Well, what you might do is say, well, let's prove security in the, in the AS model instead of in the random oracle model. So you prove security in the presence of the random oracle in this, um, evaluate, this obfuscation oracle. And what this would show is indeed that your, your protocol is resilient to the, the types of uninstantiabilities that arise from obfuscation. Because, um, right, because if, if you had an uninstantiability that arose from obfuscation, you could probably implement it in this model. And well, you just proved that you, uh, you, you don't have an uninstantiability in this model. Okay, so, okay, that's a starting point. Um, however, this idea is probably not sufficient, and there's a number of reasons why. So first, um, in this AS model, they made some non-trivial design choices for their, their, for their model. So they considered obfuscation for circuits, but, you know, maybe we have, a, we could consider obfuscation for Turing machines. We don't know if they necessarily exist, but, but they might, and maybe that changes the nature of the, of the problem. Um, another um, limitation of, of, of the AS model is that they don't allow, they allow the programs to make queries to the random oracle, but they don't allow the program to make queries to the obfuscation scheme itself. Uh, but maybe there are uninstantiabilities where you're, you know, obfuscating a program that can itself make obfuscation queries, and in which case this model wouldn't capture that. Um, beyond obfuscation, there are a variety of non-black box techniques that might be useful for an uninstantiability. Um, so um, in the Asherov Segev paper, they actually specifically mentioned the case of NISIX, that a lot of obfuscation techniques use, use NISIX and their model doesn't have any, uh, any way to obfuscate programs that um, make use of, of, of NISIX in, in their kind of model. Um, and also, if you look at, say, the, the original uninstantiability for the random oracle by Kennedy at all, it actually didn't use obfuscation at all. It used um, Macaulay's CS proofs, which we can abstract away as SNARDs. Um, maybe, there, maybe you actually have an uninstantiability based on fully homomorphic encryption. And I will point out that actually this is not, not crazy. So one of the sort of side contributions of this work was to improve the assumptions underlying the encrypt with hash uninstantiability um, to fully homomorphic encryption and a weak form of obfuscation called lockable obfuscation. Both of these are being implied by circularly secure LWE. So if you wanted to capture our new uninstantiability for encrypt with hash, you would have to have you know, both lockable obfuscation and fully homomorphic encryption. 
and we can keep going. You know, maybe maybe you have an unassignability based on MPC for um, you know non-black box programs, garbled circuits, uh, function secret sharing, and worse, maybe there's some technique that we haven't yet discovered yet, some non-black box technique that makes use of the code of a hash function that could be used in an unassignability result that we just haven't even thought of. And to make things even worse. Maybe all these things are being run on programs that make queries to other ones. So you need these all to sort of like make queries all to each other. And it gets, it gets really messy and good luck actually, you know, coming up with a coherent model. Okay, so what do we do? Um, so here, here's, here's gonna be our model, the augmented random oracle model. And let me take a moment to describe this picture. Uh, so the, the starting point is the part circled here, which is just, uh, something in the plain random oracle. Um, so we have some transform, say encrypt with hash. The transform takes as input some building block, let's say a public key encryption scheme in the case in our in our example. And so the transform can evaluate the building block, and it also can make queries to the random oracle O. Then the adversary gets to interact with the transform or the security game for the transform. In our, in our case, it'd be the deterministic encryption experiment. And along the way, the adversary can also query the random oracle. Okay, so th this is this is stuff for this part, so we're all familiar with. This is the standard random oracle model. Um, and what we do is we add this extra oracle M. And what this extra oracle M is going to do is model whatever non-black box technique you're going to try to throw at your problem in order to give an uninstantiability result. Um, so what we're going to do is, because we don't know necessarily whether you're gonna use obfuscation, polymorphic encryption, garbled circuits, whatever. So what we're gonna do is um, quantify over all possible uh, Ms. And if your transform is secure in the augmented random oracle model, if it is secure, no matter what M you choose, right? So uh, this M could, for example, be the Ashraf Segev obfuscation oracle. Um, it could be some oracle for functional encryption. It could be an oracle on the last slide that you know had all those different things, all with arrows pointing to each other. And we, um, but because we quantify over all of them, we just give one proof and immediately um, have resistance to uninstantiability results that rely on any of these tools. Okay, um, so the, the lingering questions are, one, how do you prove security in the augmented random oracle model? We, you know, we now have this extra oracle M uh, that is complicating things. Uh, certainly we can do a standard model reduction. So if you had some transform that was based on a standard model reduction, you can do the same exact thing here. There's really nothing different from the standard model from that perspective. But can we do anything more than just a, a ordinary reduction? And a related question is, can the augmented random oracle model be used to prove anything beyond the standard model, right? If somehow we end up tying our hands and all we can do is prove the security of schemes that we could prove anyway in the standard model, we kind of, the, the model is rather useless. Fine, it captures uninstantiabilities, but it doesn't really allow us to do anything else. And there are a couple challenges to this. So if we think about the kind of typical uh, techniques for um, proving security in the plain random oracle, we two of them might be observability, where the where the reduction gets to see the kinds of queries the adversary is making to the oracle and learn about what the adversary is doing and use that to solve whatever problem. The problem here is that the adversary might be making queries not only to the random oracle, but also to this oracle M. And we don't know what M does, right? M, M, M is sort of an arbitrary oracle. And also importantly, uh, we don't necessarily get to see the queries that M makes to the random oracle O. We only get to see the queries that the adversary makes to M. Um, and so what it might be, there might be oracles M that allow the adversary to hide what queries they're making to O. So, I mean, as a trivial example, M might just offer a query forwarding functionality, it might take queries from the adversary, just send them to the Oracle and tell the adversary what the response is. So the adversary might not make any random Oracle queries at all. They might all go through M. 
And worse, maybe M is somehow scrambling the queries that the, um, that the adversary is making. Um, so the other issue is programmability. So this is a random oracle technique where you have some challenge that you're trying to solve as the reduction and you embed it into some random oracle output. So you're actually programming the random oracle on certain points and hoping that by doing so, you can force the adversary to use your challenge and break it. Um, but the problem here is that when you try to reprogram the random oracle, it might be inconsistent with the M that, you, um, that the adversary sees. Now you could say, well, I'm the reduction. I get to sort of control the whole view of the adversary. I can simulate both the random oracle and M but remember that M is arbitrary. We're quantifying over all possible Ms. We don't necessarily even know what M does. So how do we reason about uh, how, how do we reason about M and show that we can program um, challenges into O and also simulate the appropriate M in order to allow us to do anything? And the fact that there are challenges here actually, you know, is is not surprising. We're trying to capture uninstantiability results, and so for any scheme that you could prove secure in the plain random oracle model, but had an uninstantiability result, we know that the techniques you use to prove the security of that scheme will not work in the augmented random oracle. So the fact that we're kind of blocking techniques is, is, is a good sign, but it also just raises the question of how, how do we argue anything? Uh, so we give an initial set of results um, for using the augmented random oracle model. Um, so we show that if you took the encrypt with hash transform and upgraded the original public key encryption scheme to be lossy, then encrypt with hash actually is secure in the augmented random oracle model. Um, so just by starting from a slightly stronger uh, notion of security that follows from most of the algebraic techniques used to construct public key encryption, we can actually um, circumvent all of the uninstantiability results we know. And I'll note that the type of security we prove for encrypt with hash is unlikely to be able to be proven in the standard model. This follows um, from some work by Wix um, a while ago. So you know this proof is not a plain reduction. We are doing something beyond the standard model. So um, you know there is utility in this model. We can prove non-trivial things. Um, so similarly, we we show that if you upgrade um, your interactive proof um, from computational soundness to statistical soundness that the fiat Shamir transform is secure in the augmented random oracle model. Um, and like the previous example, it's, you know, it was already shown by Batansky et al that it's unlikely to be able to prove this case in the standard model. Uh, and then finally, we, we look at the Fujisaki Okamoto transform um, for getting chosen ciphertext secure public key encryption. Here we actually find that we, we can't just upgrade the public key encryption scheme to lossy and suddenly get the transform to work. Um, and so we had a, we designed some new protocol that's not very efficient, um, but you know the starting assumption is lossy public key encryption. And uh, again, it's unknown whether lossy public key encryption can be used to build chosen ciphertext secure public key encryption. So this is again, something that sort of inherently uses the idealized model. Um, I, I won't go into the, the proofs here, but the idea is that we're using the statistical properties of the base system to basically allow us to brute force the oracles O and M. Um, and once we, so we, you know, in the lossy encryption case, we switched to a lossy mode and now, now security is statistical. And now we can use our unbounded computational power in the statistical setting to actually just, you know, query M and O on all of their inputs and, and this, this allows us to actually um, do the reprogramming and observing we need to prove security. All right, so before concluding, I just wanna mention that we are far from the first work to try to you know, improve the random Oracle model in order to get around um, various limitations. Um, there's the non-programmable random Oracle model, the non-observable random Oracle model that sort of explicitly just limit your, your techniques uh, that you can use to prove security. Um, However, note that for both these example, both these limit, uh, refinements of the random oracle still have uninstantiability results, namely encrypt with hash uh, can be proven in neither of these. Um, so then moving beyond idealized models, there's universal computational extractors, which seek to define a standard model notion of 
of security for hash functions that captures a wide range of use cases. Um, these UCEs, however, many of the original uh, versions of them are also uninstantiable. Encrypt with hash is an example, um, which can be proven under some variant of UCEs. Um, and then, you know, there's just been a lot of works either trying to directly instantiate random oracle model properties um, from well-established tools or just removing the random oracle model heuristic altogether, but these usually result in much less efficient protocols. Um, so the advantage of the augmented random oracle model is that we specifically designed it with the uninstantiability results in mind and designed it to circumvent all of the ones we know. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, as a reminder, if you have any questions, please come to the microphone or um, type in the chat on Zoom. Hey, so thanks for the talk. Uh, I had a couple questions. So my first question is, uh, when you were saying that we'd showed that the encrypt with hash was uninstantiable, it seemed like that only applied when we also provided this like obfuscated cheat function with it. So like, how come adding the cheat function makes you conclude that the original thing was insecure? Right, good. So so the, the theorem that was proved by BBO was that for any public encryption scheme that's CPA secure, the encrypt with hash transform is a secure deterministic encryption scheme in the random oracle model, right? So it's, it's that for all public key encryption schemes, that's important. So the uninstantiability result shows that there exists some public key encryption scheme, it's contrived. We had, to, we had to tweak an existing scheme to add this obfuscated program. It's certainly contrived. You would never design a public key encryption scheme this way, but it shows that the, the theorem for all public key encryption schemes, uh, the transform is secure, does not hold in the standard model. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, thank you. Um, and then I had another question about one of, your, one of your last slides. You showed that in the... Um, in the AROM, you were able to show some things that seem unlikely to be proved in the standard random oracle model, but I was a little confused because I thought the point of the augmented random oracle model was to like actually be able to prove less things so you don't accidentally prove something that's uninstantiable. Yeah, so why the, can you prove more things? Yeah, sorry for the confusion. So what I meant by standard models, no random oracles, just plain the plain. Oh, that's what you mean by standard yeah. model. Okay, yeah. thank you. Hey, yeah, um, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I found it very interesting. Uh, I was just wondering where you think this goes from here. Like if there's directions of future work to like directly expand the model, if like certain results should start using it, using it as is and et cetera. I, I mean, I guess to the extent possible, it would be great if you had a random oracle model proof of some protocol to sort of lift it to the augmented random oracle model. That would just, that would enable you to give, um, you know, greater confidence that there's no uninstantiability result for your scheme. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, we're running a little bit over time, so um, I think we'll have the next speaker come up. Oh, wait. Uh, um, Mark is right here. Um, so uh, next speaker is Mark uh, Zandri again. Um, and this time he'll be uh, uh, talking about uh, Okay, the paper is uh, titled to query or sorry to label or not to label in generic groups. Uh, so I guess uh, we'll give him a minute to set up the slide and then uh, go ahead. Right, uh, hi again. Um, so this talk is going to be about the generic group model, except that I've already lied to you. Actually, this talk will be about the fact that there are two very different generic group models. So the first is going to be Shoup's model. Um, and here the generic group is modeled as a uh, random injection. So you choose a random injection from ZP into bit strings where P is the order of the group. And what we're going to, we're going to interpret um, this injection L um, as, as the elements of the group. So L of X is G to the X, where G is some fixed generator of the group. 
So everyone is given access to this Oracle L. And then additionally, you're given access to a multiplication Oracle um, where you take as input two labels for group elements and it outputs the label for the, the sum. And if you think about, um, because the, um, the label of X is G to the X, uh, summing X and Y is really multiplying the group elements together. Okay, the other model is Maurer's model. Um, and instead of using labels, this uses um, pointers or handles. Um, so the way I, there's different interpretations of Maurer's model, but the way I like to think about it is as a strong type system. So there, there is an element um, data type, which contains a, a value, namely the exponent um, for the group. And the adversary and all algorithms are, are restricted to just um, being able to multiply group elements um, through a you know, explicit multiplication procedure and also test the quality of, of group elements. No other operations on, on these element variables are allowed except multiplication and quality testing. So if you take nothing else away from this talk, um, the, the key point is that these models should not be treated as the same. They should be treated as very different models. And moreover, if you have any doubts on which model you should use, you should strive to use Shoup's model, the, ran the one with random labels. This is always the preferred one. And the reason is, as we will see, that Maurer's model fails to capture many uh, textbook generic techniques to the point where many like the famous results that we know of from our um, undergrad or graduate cryptography classes just don't hold um, in Maurer's model. Okay, um, so what's interesting is that there is an apparent contradiction in the literature. So um, in 2008, Jaeger and Schwenk proved that the Maurer and Schuf's models are equivalent. Uh, and the intuition for why this might be the case is that if you have a random label from Shoup's model, there's not really a whole lot you can do with it. If you try to operate it on any way, you're going to get junk unrelated to the original group element. And so really, it seems like all you can do with a random label in Shoup's model is feed it back into the Oracle. But if all you're doing is taking outputs of the Oracle, feeding them back into the Oracle, or okay, fine, maybe you can also test equality or something like that, really... All you can do, it seems like, is work in Maurer's model. Um, and vice versa, there's an intuition for why, you know, if you have a Maurer model adversary, you might be able to get a Shoup adversary. Um, but on the other hand, um, there's a couple works that taken together prove that these are not the same. Um, so there's this work by Chen et al. that shows that Schnorr signatures are secure in Shoup's model even if you use a non-cryptographic hash function for Fiat Shamir. So even if you do like very basic, uh, 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 a very basic hash function that just, you know, does some simple bit operations for Fiat Shamir, you can still prove the security of Schnorr's um, identification or Schnorr's signatures in Shoup's model. Um, however, uh, this um, recent work of Dotling et al. shows that signatures are just flat out impossible in Maurer's model. So we have very efficient signatures in Schuf's model, no signatures at all in Maurer's model, and yet somehow the, you know, somehow they're equivalent. So the point of this talk is to kind of clarify the landscape here and um, also provide some additional results um, sort of showing that these models are actually quite different. Uh, so the starting observation for this work, um, kind of inspired by the, the contradiction on the previous slide, is that many textbook techniques that we have that work in the standard model also work in Shoup's model, but simply fail in Maurer's model. And I'm just gonna list a whole bunch here now. So consider the Bloom Macaulay PRG, uh, and suppose that, um, right, and suppose you're trying to like reason about this in Maurer's model. So what does the, what does the PRG do? It takes as input the seed, and it keeps doing a repeated exponentiation. And every time it siphons off a single bit. But if you think about it, after every round, the state is a group element because you did g to the x. So you have a, a group element. But when you want to feed it into the next round, you're feeding in an exponent, uh, which is, you know, you know, it's an integer. So somehow you need to be able to go from a group element to an integer. But this is explicitly not allowed in Maurer's model. It is allowed in Shoup's model. You take your, your take your label, 
It's just bits. You can interpret it as an integer however you want. Um, so, you know, Bloom Macaulay's PRG does not does not work in Maurer's model. Hey, there's a tons of examples like this. Merkle Damgard also does not work in Maurer's model if the um, underlying compression function is built in the canonical way from a group, right? Because the output of the compression function is going to be a group element. But now you're going to be trying to insert that group element into the input of another um, iteration of the compression function. But the inputs are exponents or you know integers. So somehow you have to be able to go again from a group element to an integer. Uh, if we try to build the Goldwright Goldwasser Macaulay pseudorandom function from PRGs, and our PRG was built from a group, we're going to run into the same problem. The output of the PRG is probably going to be a group element, but the inputs are probably going to be integers. So somehow we need to go from uh, group elements to integers. For a slightly different example, we can consider Feistel networks. So here we have this round function, and every and we're applying this round function and XORing the output of the round function into some other wire. Now, suppose a round function was built from groups. Well, the output is probably going to be a group element. For example, maybe the round function is an hour angle PRF. Um, so now we have to take a group element and somehow XOR it with a string. But all we have is a group element, and the type system of our model says that all we can do is do group multiplications and check the qualities. How do we do an XOR? Uh, what about authenticated encryption? Well, the obvious, the, the typical way we do this um, would be something like you, you apply a MAC to the ciphertext. But if your schemes were built from, uh, from groups, the output of your encryption is probably going to be a group element, but your MAC is probably going to operate on bits. So again, you know, it's the same problem. Um, Maybe let's give an example in the public key setting. Let's consider El Gamal. So the usual, um, I mean, we can consider different variants of El Gamal, whether we use um, sort of an XOR group operation to hide the message. Uh, so in the first example, uh, how you encrypt a message M is G to the R, H to the R, XOR M, where you just take H to the R and interpret it as a bit string, and use it as a one-time pad for your message. But again, that requires interpreting a group element as a bit string. Alternatively, you could just use, leverage the group operation, interpret the message M as a group element. Now we're okay for encryption. We interpret the message M as a group element. Um, and now we can use the, the group operation, which is allowed in Maurer's model to multiply G to the R and M. But the problem is decryption. We have a group element that somehow represents our message and we need to decrypt and actually get the message back. But our message is probably going to be bits, not a group element. Um, so you know, how do we do that? Um, what about signature trees? This is the usual way you would build signatures from um, symmetric key crypto. Well, here we have this tree of public keys that are each signing their, uh, the public keys of their children uh, in a group-based uh, like one-time signature scheme uh, that you might use to instantiate this tree. Your messages are going to be bits. If we think about like how Lamport signatures work, your, your, your messages are bits and you're encrypting bit by bit, or not encrypting, uh, signing bit by bit. Um, but your public keys are going to be group elements. So somehow you need to take the public key that's a group element, interpret it as bits in order to sign that public key with the, the public key of the parent. So again, this doesn't work. Um, and then here we have the example of Schnorr um, signatures where, okay, we're going to turn things on their head from the usual setting where you usually think of the group as a concrete group and you idealize the, the hash function. Here we're going to do the opposite, idealize the generic group and treat the hash function as a concrete object. But the problem is when you're applying the fiat Schmier, uh transform to, to Schnorr to get a signature scheme, you have to apply the hash function to the prover's first message. But the prover's first message in Schnorr is a group element. So how do you, how do you apply a hash function that probably you know, does bit operations or something like that to a group element? Okay, so the point is that all of these techniques are entirely generic they're even the textbook. We we see them in our in our you know uh, in our courses that we that we take as an undergrad or grad student. Um, they're independent of what group is being used, and and they actually also work in Shoup's model. Very easy to see that these work in Shoup's model, um, but they don't work in Maurer's model. And the reason is that really all that we need to get these to work is some way to interpret group elements 
as strings. Maybe we need a little more some sort of randomness property, but we just more or less need some way to interpret the group elements as strings. And Maurer's model explicitly forbids us from doing that. So these techniques don't work. Okay. Um, so we, we give a few additional results to kind of drive the point home, showing that collision resistant hash functions with unbounded domain, pseudo random permutations, and rate one um, public key encryption, just none of these exist in Maurer's model. Um, and what this shows is that if you're going to prove a, a black box separation model, model, if you're going to prove that something is impossible, you have to take it with a big grain of salt because, you know, these are all things that we, we know even exist in the standard model um, and are pretty standard um, and don't exist in Maurer's model. So it, it, it shows that you really need to, you know, some more careful interpretation of an impossibility in Maurer's model. Okay, so, so now we've established that the models are different. So how do we interpret the jaeger schwenk um, equiv equivalence? Um, there's no flaw in their work. There's no, there's no actual contradiction. Um, but what actually happened here, I think, is um, sort of just a change in perspective. Uh, um, so you know, originally, when generic groups were proposed, they were proposed as methods for analyzing the security of computational assumptions on groups or maybe crypto systems. Um, and they only started being used for black box separations for proving impossibilities sometime later, uh, maybe around a, a decade ago, for example, with the, um, the impossibility of identity-based encryption in the generic group model. Um, so with that in mind, what Jaeger Schwenk were proving was that um, from the perspective of analyzing security experiments and not feasibility of crypto systems, the models are actually equivalent in some sense, and there, there, there are some caveats here. Um, but what they showed is that if you have an adversary interacting with a game, and you have, let's say, a Maurer adversary interacting with a game or, or a Shoop adversary interacting with a game, that, that you can go between them, that you can convert any Maurer adversary to a Shoop adversary and vice versa. And indeed, this follows the intuition that we talked about earlier, that you know, there's not much you can do with a random label other than feed it back into the, um, into the oracle. Um, but the important caveat here is that this equivalence only makes sense if the game itself is a Maurer game, if the, if the game itself works in Maurer's model. If the game itself works in required Shoop's model operate, you know, say it's, uh, you know, I don't know, it's the Bloom Macaulay PRG or something like that, you would be in sort of, it, it wouldn't make sense to sort of to talk about Maurer adversaries for Shoop um, security experiments because the Maurer adversary wouldn't even be able to evaluate the PRG and you would end up with sort of trivial or, or um, meaningless uh, results. Um, so the jaeger schwenk equivalence only applies if the game itself is already a Maurer game, which was the setting that was always considered in the generic group model up until about a decade ago. Um, there is a caveat that seems to have gone unnoticed until now, though, um, which is that the yanger schwenk equivalence only applies on what are called single stage games. So these are most of the games we're familiar with in, the, in cryptography, the security of signatures, the security of, of encryption, CCA, CPA, whatever, um, basically all of the, you know, the, the classic security games. Um, but there's another type of game called multi-stage games where you have multiple adversaries each interacting with the game, but the adversaries are not allowed to interact with each other except as regulated by the game. Um, and some examples are things like deterministic encryption where the, um, the distribution of messages is modeled as an adversary, um, leakage resilience where the leakage function is modeled as an adversary, or um, one-wayness against auxiliary inputs where the distribution on inputs um, is modeled as another adversary. So there's these classes of maybe more exotic games that um, are, are, are what we call multi-stage games. And it turns out that the jaeger schwenk equivalence does not apply to these. Uh, so this brings us to the second set of results, um, which is, so we, we sort of um, reinterpret the jaeger schwenk equivalence showing that um, any crypto system or game that works in Maurer's model also works in Shoop. So one direction of the equivalence just holds always. Um, and we know that the converse is, is false in general by, by kind of the prior work and the, the prior results of this work. Um, then um, if you have a Maori game, then the converse actually does hold. Uh, I should say, um, 
Right. So amongst malware game, if you have if you have security against Shoop, then you also have um, security against malware adversaries. Um, the converse of that only holds in the single stage setting, um, where you actually do get the full equivalence. And this is what Jaeger is trying to prove. And then we complement this with a counterexample showing that in the multi-stage setting, um, malware, uh, if you consider a security against malware type adversaries, you actually sort of, you, you, you can prove things secure that shouldn't be secure. Um, so we give a deterministic encryption scheme that's insecure in standard model, insecure in Shoop's model, but you could you know, somehow prove secure in, in malware's model. Um, okay. So um, next I wanna talk about uninstantiability results. So this is um, any scheme that is secure in the generic group model, but insecure once you try to instantiate the group, the group with any concrete group. Um, and an observation is that all existing single stage generic group uninstantiability results actually only work in Shoup's model. And the, the reason is, is a typical technique um, will break the scheme by uh, finding code for eight uh, for the for the group, um, basically that such that that you know h of x equals the labeling function. So if you use a, if you use the standard group, then the labeling function has code h, and so you just you know the adversary can supply this. And if you don't, if you have a generic group, then you can't. And so all the existing single stage. Um, uninstantiability results kind of have this flavor and but this flavor only makes sense in, in Shoup's model and particularly the crypto system that you would um, obtain the the game requires Shoup's model to operate because it actually uses the labeling function itself uh, so this might lead you to think that maybe Maurer's model can avoid these uninstantiability results and we show no it can't um, and our, 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 our example is actually very simple. It's just bitwise. You just encrypt your message bitwise with El Gamal and then add one additional bit of leakage. Um, this bit, this leakage bits contrived, but you know, the normal way we model leakage resilience in crypto is, um, to allow the, allow the leakage function to be adversarial. So this is, uh, you know, pretty, I guess a relatively uncontrived, um, scheme and it shows that oh and it works in Maurer's model um, but is nevertheless unstantiable. Uh, so next we we look at identity-based encryption and it turns out that the existing work proving this proving the impossibility of identi identity-based encryption from groups doesn't quite prove an impossibility from Shoup's model um, and I, here I quoted some text from 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 the paper and basically what they say is they assume that the that all algorithms can only make queries on group elements that they were provided as input but that's a malware type restriction right it's it's saying you you know it's sort of syntactically distinguishing between bits and group elements and taking the group and and saying you can only operate on group elements in a certain way um and this is actually not just a typo it's um used um sort of crucially in the in the proof um, so what we do is we just kind of go through the proof and, and sort of redo it in a way that actually makes sense in Shoup's model, confirming that actually identity-based encryption is impossible in Shoup's. Uh, okay, and then finally, we, we, we talk about the algebraic group model. So this has been a popular model recently for um, analyzing the security of crypto systems. And here, the, the model is one where you require, so it's not, not generic, you're allowed, the adversary gets to you know, see the actual group representation, but you require that every group element the adversary produces, they have to provide an explanation for. They have to provide a sequence of exponents such that the exponent product um, with the, their input group elements actually gives the element they outputted. Um, and our observation is that the algebraic group model is actually not fully specified. Um, in that work, they were concerned about um, sort of trivial uninstantiabilities where you can, that arise from the ability to cast group elements as bit strings and back again. Um, and so they, to get around this, they say, well, group elements should not, um, or sorry, non-group elements should not depend on group elements, but they never really elaborated on what this means. And our position is that the right way to, th to think about this issue 
is that the algebraic group model should only be applied to malware type games. And this is this just cleanly resolves it. Um, so if you restrict the algebraic group model to malware games, then you know, lo and behold, there are these kind of trivial uninstantiabilities resulting from casting uh, group elements to strings and back again don't don't play a role. Um, I should mention that uh, another concurrent work also uh, observed the um, ambiguity, um, but they had a very different interpretation. Okay, so this brings us to the final set of results, which is that under our interpretation as a this is an immediate corollary, the algebraic group model is actually incomparable to Shoup's model. Um, so there are limitations to the algebraic group model. Um, so it's not you know, necessarily between um, Shoup's generic group model and standard model. For example, you would be able to prove certain multi-stage games secure in the algebraic group model that should not be considered secure. Um, and we also add an uninstantiability result showing that the algebraic group model is indeed uninstantiable. Um, and this actually resolved an open question from the original work on the algebraic group model. Okay, um, I had an open question, but it's not, uh, I'll just skip it and just go to the summary page. Um, so the summary again, Shoup's model and Maurer's model should not be treated as the same. If you were going to be proving a black box separation, Shoup is always preferred. Maurer model might be useful for gaining some idea of what's going on or guiding protocol design. Um, but in general, if you can prove Shoup, you should. And for security proofs, if your game is single stage, you're welcome to use Shoup or Maurer. They are indeed equivalent. Um, but if you're in the multi-stage setting, Maurer's model is really unsuitable and you should be using Shoup. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're running a little bit uh, over time, so I think we'll have our next speaker, Daniel, come up. And uh, if we have one quick question, uh, uh, we could take that uh, as uh, Daniel sets up. All right. All right. Uh, so our final talk of the session is lower bounds on SNARGs and the random Oracle model. And uh, Daniel uh, will give the talk. OK. Thank you. So we're going to discuss today a low bound on SNARGs in the random Oracle model. Uh, it is joint work with Iftah Heitner from Tel Aviv University and Elon Yegev from bar -Lan University. So let's start with uh, breaking down SNARGs, uh, succinct non-interactive arguments. Uh, and let's see. We are all we are cryptographic uh, audience. Most of us uh, know about proof systems, and let's specifically focus for one second on an anti-proof system. Does it prove a P who wants to prove uh, that some instance X is uh, in some language L? So he sends a proof pi and the verifier verifies, and everything is good. And uh, let's talk about what's the problem here. Uh, proof might belong, so we are using a CRS. Uh, to use both for the proof and the verifier in order to allow shorter proof, uh, as short as we like. Uh, okay. So let's talk about the random Oracle model, which is specifically uh, uh, a model which we replace the CRS with a random Oracle. That is a function who takes bit strings of arbitrary length, two bit strings of specific length, we'll call lambda is a security parameter, and the way that it works that it sends a random uh, lambda, lambda length bit string for each input. 
So a prover interacts with random oracle, then sends a proof pi to the verifier, and verifier also queries the random oracle and receives an input either accept or reject. Okay. So when we are discussing this model, well, uh, it's interesting to know what soundness are we expecting. We're expecting soundness against uh, probably conditionally unlimited adversaries, but they are limited in the number of queries they're making to the random oracle. Okay. And for main of, mainly technicality, we require some uh, requirement on the parameters. So but it, it wouldn't be completely trivial. Okay. So let's discuss completeness in this model because we know completeness of proof systems, but uh, that we have here a random oracle which changes the completeness uh, definition by a bit. And if you are having an instance fee uh, and the language, language L, which we will now for the stock think about as set, preset, and an instance fee is a formula, which you want to see if it's satisfiable, then the completeness says that over high probability over the distribution of the random oracle, we have that the verifier, given the proof computed by the prover, will actually choose to accept. Okay. And uh, we get alpha completeness if this probability is greater than alpha. So for soundness, we have both parameters, which are T and epsilon. And T will be a bound of malicious provers ability, the number of queries it can make to the random oracle. And epsilon will be a bound of its security of the probability that it actually managed to cheat. So we get T epsilon soundness if for any instance that is not satisfiable or in, in the general setting, any input that does not belong to the language, we have the probability at T query computationally unbounded adversary P uh, to make the verifier accept is lower than epsilon. Okay. So uh, why do we like this model? Why it is even important? Why am I considering uh, this as part of my research? Uh, first, it is quite simple. It's information theoretic. There are no uh, uh, harness assumptions on groups or anything like that uh, that we need in order to make useful constructions on the first place. Uh, surely they are helping to build a stronger models, uh, but we, we can actually uh, build models just in the by random oracle. Furthermore, many known constructions are first construction constructed in the random oracle model, uh, which we'll we see late, shortly how snarks are constructed in the random oracle model. And uh, when there are now constructions in the random oracle model, there are also many lower bounds in the random oracle model. When it is the basic uh, step to prove a lower bound, uh, and which mainly is done by information theoretic scheme and techniques. Uh, furthermore, there's the wrong heuristic, which means that if you have a construction of some primitive in the random oracle model, then you can switch back to the standard model by replacing the random oracle by some lightweight people. For example, you can take the random oracle and substitute it with some hash function. When, uh, and okay, so, this, this Haram heuristic has several uh, interesting features. First one, uh, all of the constructions are fast to compute because they use only lightweight crypto. And they need no trusted setup. And well, potentially cost quantum, depending on which function are you using and how you have to prove it in the random oracle model. And they are widely used in practice. Okay. So let's talk about some SNARD constructions. And the first one is due to Mikali in, two, in, one, in 94, which enjoyed with the proof length of log T over epsilon squared times log N, and is the witness size for the empty statement. And specifically, we are talking about reset uh, here as well. And the number of verified queries to the random oracle is log of T over epsilon, okay? And recently proved in 2021 by Chiesa and Yogev, there are proof length of log t over epsilon times log t times log n, and the same number of verified queries. And uh, you probably are asking yourself, how did they make uh, to manage build any of such constructions? So the overall view is the following. You, took an you take an information theoretic proof, for example, a PCP, uh, and some sort of cryptographic commitment scheme. And Mikali used the Merkle tree, 
and Chesenia gives specifically used a stronger uh, notion of PCP, but a weaker version of commitment scheme. And they managed to uh, reduce the proof length. So you can see and have an intuition why the commitment scheme is actually the more heavier out here. And we'll see in a short while how this is helping us. Uh, note that the verify queries stay the same. And this is because there's also a known lower bound from JSN you get in 2020, which states that the number of verify queries required in order to make such a scheme secure is indeed omega of log of T over epsilon. This is the best we can hope for right now already there. Okay. So in terms of proof length, which is the main, uh, let's say, parameter we're focusing on when talking about efficiency, uh, this is how the world looks like. There was Mikali, which was slightly more than quadratic argument size. There was a trivial lower bound, and which is log T over epsilon. Uh, you can obtain it just by uh, playing with the definitions and actually just trying to cheat and hope you're the best you have. And CY Chesenio Gev has managed to improve the upper bound by a bit. Uh, it is quadratic, which is important, but there is still a lot of open space over here. So I've seen an open space. So let's see uh, and improve the lower bound. And I'm going to discuss right now our lower bound. So this is out here. It states that uh, assuming the rational randomized exponential time hypothesis, which state that SAT cannot be proven by cannot be solved by a randomized algorithm with with less than exponential linear time, two to the power of delta n for some n. Uh, we are having the following. Every snog in the random molecule, which is natural, which I'll explain just, just in a second, has, which has t epsilon soundness, has also proof size, which is omega of log t over epsilon times log t divided by log of qp, which is the number of queries the prover makes to the random molecule. Note that this is almost tight because Chess and Yogev's uh, constructions had a log n and times uh, uh, log qp uh, in length, okay? So this is almost tight. Uh, you can think about qp as a poly polynomial in n, so it's actually log n squared. Uh, in most settings, this is actually uh, correct and specifically uh, where let's really focus it now. Okay, so what are natural constructions? Natural constructions enjoy the following uh, Let's say, okay, natural constructions have non-adaptive deterministic verifier. This means that when you get an, uh, an answer to some query to the random model, you don't use it to make another query to the random model. This means that you also can find the list of the queries to the random model before making any query. And enjoy salted soundness, which I'll also explain later in a, in a different slide. Note that, we are, we are requiring reasonable uh, number of queries both by the prover and the verifier. Let's say poly n by the prover um, for the verifier, not extremely uh, uh, large. And uh, this is more of a technical issue uh, over here for the low one not to be quite trivial because you can use a large amount of prover queries to make uh, trivial snarks for, in some sense. And let's state that it is, it's important to state that uh, current extractions, current constructions, which are non-contrived, are, are indeed natural. They do have salted soundness. I'll explain later again what it is. They are non-interactive or easily can make non-interactive with allowing uh, a constant blow up in argument size at most. And they have reasonable P, Q and, uh, QP and QV. So, this is how the world looks like for natural constructions with this work. We can see Mikali's argument and CY's constructions. They say the same, they're also natural. And there are, there's the improved lower bound, which almost matches the upper bound uh, uh, presented by Chaya and you get. Okay. So uh, this directly implies a lower bound on sub vector commitment, which I'm going to run through briefly, but the main thing you, the main key takeout from here is that if you can build with a cryptographic commitment scheme, a SNAR, 
using a PCP, then you can actually induce a lower bound on subvector commitment from a lower bound on SNARKs. Specifically, if a subvector commitment is T epsilon binding in the random oracle model, which is a similar, uh, which is a similar definition to what I've seen before, and alpha is the commitment length for the for the number of n elements, and beta of m is a function with a, was actually the length of the string needed to open n elements. Then we get that alpha plus uh, beta evaluated at log t over epsilon is uh, is a flank at least omega log t over epsilon times log t divided by log of the number of queries the uh, subvector commitment the commitment commitment uh, party has. Okay, and this is also tight because we have Merkle trees and other uh, construction that are actually. Uh, the construction in JSN you give is a subvector commitment, uh, which almost matches uh, this lower one. And we prove it by showing that subvector commitment together with a PCP in, indeed yield a snark. So uh, you compile it and then uh, get a contradiction, or however you want to prove it to the lower bundle snarks. So let's discuss salted sums because uh, this is a new definition that is worth uh, noticing. And the main uh, uh, idea of salted sums is, is that approver may query uh, the random oracle with specific query more than once and get two different results he can choose from. Let's talk about it more formally. Uh, malicious prover query X receives a Y and he may choose to query X once again and get another y. Now, both y and y prime shown here are independent and uniform of the strings of length lambda, the security parameter. But they are distinct. And the prover, the malicious prover in, in, in this sense, can choose which one that he likes. If he wants uh, to take out y as the answer to x, he can choose it. If you take one to take one y prime, he can choose that as well. And then a malicious prover sends a message pi to the verifier, the same way uh, we've seen again. And the random oracle the verifier ha have access to is fixed with the queries. This means that if the malicious prover has chosen y prime and the verifier queries x, he will get y prime, okay? This is a limited uh, ability to program the random oracle. And note that non-construction do indeed have salted soundness. It is actually quite easy to prove for Mikali and uh, other construction do have this as well. And it is very easy to construct a, a snog which has no salted soundness, but we haven't found until today a way to use this to actually create a shorter argument size. So, um, for, and in addition, it is seems quite hard to get rid of salted sums without making the verifier adaptive in some sense. Okay. So how do we prove our lower bound? Now, in, now that we know what is salted sums, we take a snog with a short proof length and transform it with snog with small verifier complexity. And specifically, does the lower bound of JSN you give from 2020 states that a, a snog with small ver verifier query complexity can be transformed to a fast algorithm for a SAT. This means that if we have snag with two small proof lines, sl smaller than the lower bound we are about to see, we will get a snag with small query complexity, which will then may be, may be able to transform to a sub-exponential fast algorithm for a SAT. It will be randomized, but this will contradict the exponential time hypothesis. So let's talk a bit more about properties of this transformation. Well. The proof size is unchanged. Actually, the proof itself is unchanged, uh, and especially its size. In addition, soundness is unchanged. Note that we require the original snug with a small proof length to have salted soundness, and the snug with small query complexity will have a not exact parameter for salted soundness, but will have regular soundness with the same parameter epsilon and non trivial completeness. And when I mean not when I say non-trivial, I mean that the completeness is slightly larger 
then the soundness error. Well, this is not uh, the best completeness you would hope for, but it actually it is actually enough to compute to transform it to a fast algorithm for SAP. So I wouldn't recommend doing this in a practical uh, world, but it is enough to prove a lower bound. And the verifier running time of the new construction here is t to the power of one over constant. So, and where complexity is slightly less than log of t over epsilon. For the lower bound, if, if you take exactly what the lower bound states, it will get to log of t over epsilon. So let's discuss this transformation, explain you how it works. So first let the node, okay. So the first thing we're gonna do is describe the new verifier because the prover of the new snog is completely unchanged. So let the, let, let the oracle as zeta, which takes, again, bit strings to run a bit strings of length lambda. We have an input, which is the formula phi and the proof phi generated by the prover. And we're going to do the following. First, let's enumerate the, the queries of the ver original verifier when run on phi and pi as u1 up to um, I mean some uh, parameter. And recall that v is non-adaptive, so we can do this. Okay, there is no, we know in advance all of the queries together. And the next thing we're going to do is to sample a k, k size subset of these indices, of the m indices. It will correspond to a set of length k of the queries. Why is this? We are actually three different uh, queries that, in, that are in the set and queries that are not. Queries that are in this set, we're going to query as usual to the random oracle. Queries that are not in this set, we are gonna, for them, we're gonna uniformly choose two to the power of gamma, a parameter, candidate answers, which are independent random bit strings. So let me repeat that again to make sure everything is clear. We're gonna uh, query for uh, indices in J as usual. And for indices not in J, we're gonna query an, a large number, a, a really large number of candidate answers. And except if any combination of the candidate answers for the query is not in J, together with the random, random oracle answers to the queries in J, make the original verifier accept. And this is well defined because the verifier is non-adaptive. So we'll take a gamma to be around log t, log t over four, for example, and k be the proof size divided by gamma. Again, this is our notation over here. And we'll, we'll state that if the original snag has t and epsilon salted soundness, then the new snag we're going to have with t and b slide has t epsilon soundness. And there is also non-trivial completeness when for our choices parameter is slightly larger than epsilon, the soundness uh, parameter. So it is indeed a non-trivial snark. And let's discuss motivating examples here because uh, I want you to understand why is this uh, built this way. And we're going to divide a word to, to uh, the queries of the random oracle to two types. One that is, has to be made anyway to the random oracle and one that we somehow can get rid of. So let's see how it goes. The first example is following. There is a proof by who, who is actually made of one answer to the random to a query for the, to the random auto. So the verifier queries that query and uh, compares with the answer written in the proof, except if it's, if, if it's equal, reject if not. And what we, what we're meaning that in our transformation, if we choose this query as the set of J we query the random oracle, we will manage to get the new verifier to accept. And if not, we have no chance of doing so because we are only sampling two to the power of gamma options when there are two to the power of lambda options. So the probability is bounded by uh, two to the power of gamma minus lambda, which is uh, exponentially small in uh, log t. It's actually a polynomial in t. And that's one number. So note that we have to make them in the set, but a short proof cannot have many of these queries written inside the proof because each one of them is a uniform random string and has large entropy. Uh, in, the other, in the other hand, we have this uh, snog, which takes a K queries and XOR them and put the answer in a proof. So it's a game of the same length, 
But if for each query we query, we're having two to the power of gamma options, and gamma is indeed large, and gamma is indeed large enough, more than lambda over k, then we will manage to finally fit an answer. Uh, you can see uh, Perot's independence of the XOR of two different uh, answer options, and then yield that it is actually uh, plausible you will find a fitting solution, one that the XOR is indeed what's written in it. So we either have query, we want to say that there are other have queries that we are need to be in the proof and because they have entropy, they make it proof large or one that can get rid of. This is the one that's in J and not in J uh, respectively. So let's discuss completeness. We're going to show a lemma uh, that shows that we must make around the length of the proof divided by gamma queries, and the rest can be completed by the uniform sampling that we discussed earlier. Uh, it will be with quite good probability. And the probability that V will guess indeed the queries that it actually needs to make to the random oracle is small, but as long as J is small, it is slightly larger than the soundness error epsilon. And uh, does here the lemma that states exactly that. Let's x denote to be a, a series of random variables uh, with n coordinates over uh, lambda bit strings to the power of n, which has high entropy, almost they're missing L bits to have full entropy. Then a uh, sample consists of about O of L to, divided by gamma binding coordinates, one that you have to uh, uh, fix, and the other can be completed using form something. And First, we show that for a specific subset, uh, all, if we fix that, we have lar large entropy for everything. And uh, sorry, I'm running it because I don't have really much time. And um, okay, we can discuss it later if you want to come to me or read the paper. Um, let's discuss soundness. Soundness is actually coming directly from the fact that we have salted soundness, uh, as we described earlier. We construct the following. Uh, malicious prover, uh, given a malicious prover that calls v uh, The first thing it does is simulate uh, p prime to obtain a proof. And then it emulates the R new verifier. And the verifier queries to the random oracle. So you simulate it by querying in the, sol in, uh, the game we discussed earlier for salted soundness. You will see uh, on one minute it is. And choose the answer that will make there are new verifier except it samples a lot of options. We can sample them uh, in the solid soundness game I described earlier. And then because these two games uh, are identical, both attack and the game are quite identical in nature, we can find uh, the combination was making it to accept. And this is how it looks like both for the solid soundness game and what we die actually does, that the verifier does us in this other sense. So let's conclude. Uh, we have now it in the, the Morka model for have optimal size between log t over epsilon times t times log n, just and you give and our log t over epsilon. Uh, but for natural constructions, we are over almost a notching lower of oh, low bounds. And it is less left open to find a general low bound without requiring non additivity or salted soundness or to improve to improve our current constructions with a scenario that does not have salted soundness and indeed is shorter in, size, in argument length. Thank you. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, please come to the microphone or uh, type your question in on Zoom. So I guess uh, um, one quick question while we're waiting. Um, I wonder uh, if you wanted to speculate, uh, um, is it going to be possible to build uh, an improved SNAR, you know, that's kind of unnatural, or uh, do you think uh, the current lower bound is actually the right, uh, um, right answer, even if you eliminate this natural assumption? Mm -hmm. um, personally, I think uh, the correct answer is that the lower bound can be expanded. And I think it will be uh, quite easier to, ex to expand it, uh, assuming some other more natural uh, constructions, or let's say zero knowledge snarks or everything like that. And I think for the general case, it holds as well. Law one should hold as well. 
Hey, so thank you for the talk. Uh, you, uh, I guess, claimed that there, the gap between your lower bound and the existing uh, size constructions, which is like this factor of log n times log qp is small, but I didn't get the intuition for why I should think of that as small. Like why, for example, why isn't log qp like large relative to log t? And so we like, you know, if, if log qp is like, linear in log t then like the lower bound hasn't changed really right yeah um what we for most parameter settings what we're doing is that uh, qp is actually the in the order of poly n and is uh the number of squares now uh, of the is the instant it's the witness size actually oh, it's the witness size yeah and is the witness size and qp is mostly poly in n so it's actually order of log n. Know that if log t were order of log n, then anyway we have uh, ex extremely short snags. And actually, we can show that this is uh, we can show like independently this is not possible, uh, assuming some uh, standard complexity assumptions. Hmm. All right. Uh, let's take uh, further questions uh, offline, and uh, let's thank Daniel and uh, all the speakers of the session.